Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. I want to thank um, uh, Jill and Tiffany. Uh, I think Tiffany, they came up with the idea for the agenda. And then Tiffany uh, helped put that PowerPoint together for me from uh, my notes and, and got everything. Oh, Tiffany. So thank you, Tiffany. Okay. Okay. So um, section two. Uh, everybody have a chance to read it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Great. Um, I'm going to get that PowerPoint up and then, uh, you know, we can, you can decide if I, you want me to read some of the stuff or if you already read it, we don't even have to. Well, let's just move along like that. So bear with me. I'm, uh, you can do this. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, share screen. Anybody seen anything? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. How about now? Oh, it's there coming. We there, there we, we go. go. All right. Nice. Thanks. You don't know how much work that was for me even after Tiffany did it. So <laughs> section, so I can't, I, I know I can't put it together. I appreciate it. No. So uh, section two, employing smart and effective policing standards and strategies. First thing I want to do is I went through our department rules and regs and picked up some of the policies that um, I thought promote uh, procedural justice. Um, you know, section 101-4, the law enforcement code of ethics. Would everybody like me to read the, the code of ethics? Okay, <laughs> so as a, as a law enforcement officer, my fundamental duty is to serve mankind, to safeguard lives and property, to protect the innocent against deception, the weak against oppression or intimidation, and the peaceful, peaceful against violence or disorder, and to respect the constitutional rights of all people to liberty, equality, and justice. I will keep my private life unsullied as an example to all, maintain courageous calm in the face of danger, scorn or ridicule, develop self-restraint and constantly be mindful of the welfare of others. Honest in thought, indeed, in both my personal and official life. I will be an, ex an exemplary, I will be exemplary in obeying the laws of the land with the directors of my department. Whatever I see or hear of a confident nature or that is confided to me in my official capacity will never, will be kept ever secret unless revelation is necessary in the performance of my duty. I will never act officiously or permit personal feelings, prejudices, animosities, or friendships to influence my decisions. With no compromise for crime and with relentless prosecution of criminals, I will enforce the law courteously and appropriate without fear or favor, malice or ill will, never employing unnecessary force or violence and never accepting gr gratuities. I recognize the badge of my office as a symbol of my public faith and I accept it as a public trust to be held so long as I'm true to the ethics of the police service. I will constantly strive to achieve these objectives and ideals, dedicating myself before God and the chosen profession, law enforcement. Uh, section 102-4, and their duties and responsibilities, members shall not knowingly associate with any person or organization which advocates hate, hatred, prejudice, or oppression of any racial, eth ethnic, or religious group, or which disseminates defamatory material. Section 105-1, sub 57, 58, 59, members shall uh, give name and present badge to anyone requesting it. Members shall be courteous and respectful, and members should not use discourteous or disrespectful remarks re regarding another person's ethnicity, race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation. Section 121, community relations and crime prevention, uh, talks about courtesy. Employees shall be courteous to the public in person, on the telephone, or in any contact. Employees must be tactful in the performance of their duties, strive to control their tempers while exercising the utmost patience and discretion and they shall not engage in argumentative discourses even in the face of extreme provocation. While in the performance of their duties, employees shall not curse, uh, of course, violent, profane, or insolent language, gestures, and shall not express any prejudice concerning race, religion, politics, national origin, lifestyle, or related circumstances. And the last one I had there is, is uh, section 115-1A, but it's just a, a policy strictly related to non-biased policing, so I didn't include it in here, but I can give anybody a copy of it if you desire. Chief, can I ask you, where do these sections come from? What code or book? We have a department manual. Okay. They, they weren't written by Unique Newcastle. to Newcastle? Like they came from something else, no? Or were the, they written the, by Newcastle? The, the first one, uh, the, the Law Enforcement Code of Ethics is, is, is a known code of ethic thing, and we adopted it as our 
code of ethics. Um, other stuff has been developed, you know, for many years, policies and procedures. By, by, by whom? Uh, it's if like, you know. uh, lieutenants and, and chief for administration throw out, you know, the course of Newcastle Police Department. There's always been a, a rules and regs and it's just developed and added to or re redacted or stuff was reduced or taken out as needed. And is each department um, unique, have a, its own unique code? Yes, yes. But accredited, accredited agencies are required to have, to be in compliant with 21 specific standards. So those are, are mandatory to be in there, but we have many more than, than those. Got it. So, so, so I guess the question is, um, I mean, I, you know, I have, I have code of ethics, things that I have responsible to in my profession and in, you know, in several programs that are regulated. Um, the question is, I mean, a code of ethics isn't enough. It's a statement of aspiration. I guess the question that occurred to me are, um, you know, are there blind spots there that aren't necessarily, I mean, you can have a code of ethics, somebody has to interpret it their own way. I mean, and that kind of is the issue with systemic racism as a white man. I, yeah, I can go from my point of view, but that doesn't mean I don't have blind spots. And I guess the question then is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good thing to have a code of ethics, but, but what is its role exactly? Like it sets a baseline, it's aspirational, it's not the end, it's, it's part of. Well, it, that's kind of thing. well they're, all, they're all sections of the department manual that everyone has to uh, abide by, sign off on, and expect it to adhere to. Chief, how well, is it enforced? Right, yeah. Uh, well, it, if, if an example was brought to us where these aren't happening or it's observed, it depends on it, you know, what it was. You know, it could be verbal counseling, it could be written counseling, it could be, you know, um, disciplinary charges, it could be, it could be anything. Have we experienced any of uh, any complaints um, in this realm uh, in the past, say, five years? Um, you know, I broke that down um, as to what our complaints are about, but I don't specifically remember anything we got related to this. Yeah, I saw, I saw the majority uh, of the relatively few complaints were basically internal. I, I noticed that in, in uh, the information you're giving us, I, if, if I'm correct. Yes, correct. That, that we observed the violation and looked into it. Um, Unfor unfortunately, and, and this is great, unfortunately, um, this, this is good um, as long as there are people comfortable enough to actually um, bring it to, bring any violation of it to the proper authority's attention. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think part of what we're working on right now is there is a swath of the population who does not feel comfortable uh, bringing even complaints about violations against them, you know, they wouldn't be comfortable bringing anything uh, like this to um, law enforcement's um, attention, which actually brings the question up, what kind of a body would that swath of population be comfortable bringing any type of complaint or um, uh, bring notice to? Uh, what, 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 could, what could we create so that people would feel comfortable bringing it to our attention? Does that make sense? You know, yeah, my idea here was to try to explain what we do and the things we have in yeah. place to try to promote procedural justice and community policing. Um, yeah, I'm just putting the greater question out there. I, wanna, I understand that. We want to get through the section and then, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. talk about it more. I think that may be a good way to make sure you get all your information out so then we can have everything in one place and start discussing it. Mm -hmm. all right. Okay. So uh, procedural justice change uh, training. New York State Department of Criminal Justice endorsed the procedural justice training curriculum to provide training in two eight-hour training modules. The first module is procedures, procedural justice part one. The curriculum focuses on the four tenets of procedural justice, treating individuals with dignity and respect, giving individuals a voice during law enforcement 
uh, and interactions, being neutral and transparent in decision making, conveying trustworthy motives. Um, procedural justice part two focuses on implicit bias. Um, our, I get, our mission statement parallels the principles of procedural justice training and has we have two officers scheduled to attend the uh, DCGS training um, next month and then we're going to bring that back to the department for uh, uh, training next year. I mentioned some of the um, community policing things, um, uh, policies that we have and um, really I've mentioned them elsewhere so I don't know if we need to you know, go through them one by one. I, I included a bunch of them in section one as well. Yeah. So is this the place where we talk about the most productive way to proceed? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that it, Jeremy? Is this where well, we talk about I, that? I want to just make sure, and I want to be very sensitive too, because I don't want to seem rushed at all. I just want to make sure he gets all of his things out because we can, I'm sure we can speak on one topic for an extended period of time, but at least let's try to get his information out and maybe just keep notes that we want to discuss and circle back to it. Does that work? Sorry, I'm confused. What are you asking us to do? You're asking us to listen and let the chief finish the presentation and then we're going right. to comment? Let, yeah, let the chief go through the presentation. So, so all his information, because some of the things we may ask or address, he might address later on in the presentation. So let him get everything out and then we can come back and discuss whatever it may be that we want to discuss that he addressed today. Okay. Can, can I just can I just ask one thing? I, that sounds great, but um, in circling back, can we please, once the chief is finished with his presentation, can then we go back and begin the conversation going back to the first slide? Because I think that will trigger, you know, notes are good, but I think all, it, it, it might trigger the conversation uh, in a more effective way. I think that's I think that's fair. I, I, I'm not the judge of what what will best work. So if that's going to work, that's fine. Again, I just want to make sure he's able to share everything so that if there's something out there, oh right. wait a second, I, I had this in mind. He's addressing it here instead of us going back and forth mm -hmm. on a issue that he's already dealing with. So uh, sure. just for the sake of productivity, I think that's the best way to do it. And then as much time as we need to go through everything, starting from the beginning. Yeah, there's certainly some topics I think that are going to be um, um, popular or something that we're gonna to wanna to talk about. All right, uh, stop and frisk and broken windows. NCPD does not utilize a stop and frisk policy for minor crimes. Uh, sorry. Uh, we have a detailed stop question and frisk policy, section 1-7. Um, broken windows policing theory that minor offenses committed in public contribute to a degradation of society that in turn incubates more serious crimes. We don't have an issue in town with that. Um, and then discriminatory or bias stops, uh, discriminatory or bias stops, searches and arrests are prohibited by department policy. Uh, next one is chokeholds. So they're addressed in section 105-6, use of deadly force of firearms, chokeholds and carotid holds, chokeholds, carotid holds, and similar compressions of the neck represent the potential use of deadly physical force and shall never be used unless an officer or another person is in imminent danger of death or serious physical injury and all other reasonable measures to reasonably repel the attack have been exhausted. Um, as I just added, that's consistent with the MPT model policy. And in their language is chokeholds and obstruction of breathing or blood circulation, uh, any application of pressure to the throat, windpipe, neck, or blocking of the mouth or nose of a person in a manner that may hinder breathing, reduce intake of air or obstruct blood circulation is prohibited unless deadly physical force is authorized. Um, and I talk later about how it's, be, it's been reviewed by us. Um, in use of force. So, use of force, NPCD. Okay. So I can't read the screen because you guys are blocking part of it. So I'm going back to my notes. That seems to be the where I'm going back and forth. So I apologize. Uh, use of force. NCPD has a use of force policy outline and rules and regulations. Section 105-6, use of deadly force and firearms and internal procedure in the case of force being used by an officer. The situation and circumstances are automatically investigated by a police supervisor, regardless of whether or not a civilian complaint is filed. Force is never used for retaliatory or punitive reasons. Use of force is only permitted when, in the performance of their duty, to prevent the commission of a breach of the peace or other unlawful act, to prevent a person from injuring him or herself, to effect a lawful arrest of persons 
person or persons resisting arrest or attempting to flee from custody in self-defense or in the defense of another. The use of force is not permitted for punitive or retaliatory measure. And we actually did add our use of force policy to the um, department webpage, so it is there for, for review. And um, an annual review is conducted of our use of force policy. It's also reviewed with, um, it's, it's gone over with each member. And I, I last updated it October 7th, because on September 3rd, 2020, a new standard was voted on and approved by the Law Enforcement Agency Accreditation Council um, during their quarterly meeting. The new standard has been deemed critical, therefore increasing the total number of critical standards for accreditation from 19 to 20, the total number of standards in general from 109 to 110. This standard um, deals with the health of persons in custody and will require agencies to have a written directive that outlines the response to medical and mental health of persons in custody pursuant to New York civil rights law in accordance with the MPTC use of force model policy. And use of force policy is modeled after the MPTC po current policy, and this is uh, required by New York State accreditation. And the last outside review of our use of force policy was conducted by accredited um, during our January this year audit. Uh, pretextual stops are prohibited. Quotas, we don't have quotas, um, uh, but you know, officers are expected to be productive, and you know, we, and we do expect them to enforce the vehicle traffic law and other laws or violations as they come across. So, um, shooting and moving vehicles. Um, it's outlined in rules and regs, section of uh, use of deadly force. Officers are prohibited from discharging their firearms at or from a moving vehicle, motorcycle, or bicycle. Collecting, collectively moving vehicle. Unless officers reasonably de de believe deadly force is necessary to defend the officer or a third person from the use or imminent use of deadly force. For purposes of this policy, officers will not discharge their firearm at moving vehicles except under extreme circumstances. Such discharges will be rig rigorously scrutinized. Officers shall, as a rule, avoid tactics that can place them in a position where a vehicle could be used against them. When confronted with an oncoming moving vehicle, officers must attempt to move out of its path and should generally avoid placing themselves in situations where the use of deadly force is, is unlikely. And then we have high speed pursuits. Again, it's another specific procedure outlined in section 110 10. Uh, SWAT teams, we don't have SWAT teams. If we, you know, we outlined when we could actually call for one. And if we did, it'd be the Western County Department of Public Safety. Um, uh, no knock door endorsement. I request that a search warrant authorized the executing police officer to enter the premise to be searched without giving notice of his authority and purpose upon the ground that there is reasonable cause to believe that the property sought may be easily or quickly destroyed or disposed of, or the giving of such notice may endanger the life or safety of the executing officer or another person. Or in the case of application of the search warrant as defined in paragraph B, subdivision two of section 609.05 for the purpose of searching for and arresting a person who was the subject of a warrant for a felony. The person saw it reflected to commit another felony or may endanger the life or safety of the executing officer or another. Uh, any request made pursuant to the subdivision, subdivision must be accompanied by and supported by allegations of fact that prescribe. Tasers and, pep and pepper spray. Um, we have policies for both. Less lethal technology and tools provide officers with the use of force option that decreases the possibility of injury to the suspect and the officers. Um, again, outline those two policies. Um, facial recognition technology, we, we don't want to have access to everyone that. Okay, section two, was force the strategies to reduce racial disparities and build trust. Uh, summons is a warrantless arrest. Criminal summons are used when appropriate. Um, diversion programs that recently came up, off of one, came up with one and uh, I've been working on instituting that. It's called Hope Without Handcuffs. The idea behind it is that someone um, who's has a, a, a drug problem and comes into the department with drugs and is looking for help, and we call an outside agency to we would take the drug, we call an outside agency to take them and help them and give them some guidance. We also use, um, have used community service for, for juveniles. Okay. Then we have restorative justice program. You know, most minor disputes- I'm sorry, excuse me. I, somebody has their mic on and it sounds like there's wind or something blowing. I'm having a really hard time hearing. I don't know if anybody else is or not. No? I, I could try and to talk. I'll just now. have to check my, I'll check my computer. Thank you. Um, where was I? Uh, we, we don't have a 
uh, community outreach and violence interruptions programs. We, we don't have anything like that at this time. Uh, hotspot policing areas are targeted for a specific reason. Sure, we use that if we have a stretch of burglaries or car larcenies or for chronic traffic complaints. De-escalation strategy. Um, also, there's a training de-escalation strategy during recruit training, uh, professional communications, procedural justice, crisis intervention training, uh, role-playing scenarios all deal with de-escalation. It's an overall theme of the academy. For every verbal judo is what we used to call it, de-escalation. Many of our older officers attended this course was de-escalation. Um, I recently updated our use of last year, I think, updated our use of force policy incorporating actually de-escalation into it. Uh, each officer, we use a weekly online series that you know deal with um, legal updates and uh, de-escalation. And last year, we actually sent everybody to a use of force simulator where there's scenario-based training. And uh, you know, depending on how you de-escalate the officer holds themselves, it, it either rises up, could rise up to a deadly confrontation or it could, you know, be resolved. So it, it's, it's, it's actually real life training and uh, it's very helpful. Let's see. Effective investigations in hate crimes. Um, you know, we outline our rule and re regulation section specifically regarding hate crimes, but you know, our detectives are, are very good and handle any crime very well. So three, community engagement, um, community outreach plans. So currently no specific plan, but I would name some of the things we do. Uh, citizen advisory boards and committee. We, we don't have one currently, but I, I, when I, during the review of this, I, I thought it was a good idea if we can you know, name a community advisory board where we meet, I don't know, quarterly or uh, yearly, you know, that would be one of my suggestions that we should incorporate into our plan. And also I thought a, a, a community survey would be a, Good, maybe a yearly survey to send out the residents to get an idea of uh, the opinion of what the community thinks we're doing. So, uh, partnership with community organizations and faith communities. We have a strong relationship with Temple FL and FCC, as you can see, Martha. <laughs> and we, we have working knowledge with every other um, religious or organization in town. And partnering with students and schools, we have SRO, uh, school liaison officer, and um, a youth officer. Then attention to marginalizing communities. Um, if, we, if we're dealing with somebody who is, has a language significant, we do have four bilingual officers. They have the Translate app on their phone. We have a language line that we can call into. Um, we also can um, call for mutual aid to any other that line department, ask for an officer who speaks a certain language. And then communication for people with disabilities. For the hearing pad, we have a, a TTY relay. And they're generally made using a text to telephone, which is a communications device equipped with a keyboard for typing messages and screens for reading messages. TTY device connects to the standard phone line. That's hooked up into our dispatch. And for autism spectrum disorders, parents of autistic children and young adults under age 21 years of age that have autism can submit informational sheets and photographs to children to this department. This information is then entered into a record management system and the search would highlight that. We say under 21, but anybody who wanted to provide the information to us would certainly um, would add that to, to, to flag when we deal with them. And LGBTQIA, uh, we don't have anything in addition other than the policies and procedures I mentioned earlier. Um, and, but I just want to know, we do have one officer who has the same sex partner working for us. Okay, that was a mouthful. So, so do we want to go back? To yeah, so why don't we open it up? Why don't we open up so that everyone can share their thoughts or ask their questions or make their comments? So um, I don't remember who was it. Vince, were you the one who were or, or Kimberly? I don't know who had some issues to address initially. Well, I was just I was just suggesting that we go back to the first um, the first fra frame so that if anybody it, it will jog people's memory along with their notes. Sure. Um, so I, I I had a question. Um, regarding the um, enforcement of the ethics code. I, mean, I, I, I agree with Hardy that you know it, it's aspirational and it's really good. Um, unfortunately, I know lots of lawyers who don't follow the code of ethics uh, for lawyers either. Um, and they often don't get sanctioned. So um, I'm, just, I'm just curious as to you know, how that plays out. And I guess um, it, it, my suggestion is kind of like, um, 
Chief Carroll seems to have, have recommended at some point, maybe um, a citizen advisory board. I, I'm just thinking if, if you know, something like that might be uh, a place where people who are not comfort comfortable enough to bring any type of complaint regarding ethics or other things to the police directly, it, there's a board of some sort, maybe it's an advisory board, I don't know, um, where they can bring that concern. Um, it, it's just something to throw out there. Are you thinking something like oh, a CPRB? Yeah, but not exactly like that. You know what I mean? Because I, you know, that, that when people hear that, <laughs> right, right. they understandably are very reticent about that. Um, not that it really has a lot of sway, quite honestly. But yeah, it, it's something like that, but more of an advisory board yep. rather than a complaint board, if you will. But it would, it would serve the same function among other functions. Um, I, I'm just I, I, concerned because we ha we do have a large population who just won't go to law enforcement for um, certain things. Kimberly, so, I think what we had recommended from the CRE was that we almost form a group of legal and policy advisors um, yes. and almost serve as an ombudsman. Um, to be able to report and follow up on behalf of um, people who may be intimidated um, in the case of making reports. Yes, that was one of our, uh, hey, for yeah, our um, policing and emergency services, that was one of our recommendations, which I, I think could be very valuable in this situation. Jim, I was just wondering, it's Christine. So I feel like there's two layers of addressing issues. So one is, is deals with confidentiality and employees. And if you have an issue that you need to address, you have to protect their privacy and address it. And the other is um, identifying themes that might not, necessar not necessarily be targeted at a, at a particular incident, but just a general um, thematic discussion about how to make improvements in the department. In terms of addressing employees that aren't adhering to the code of ethics for potentially like some kind of discipline situation, have you talked at all about having a, someone who would specialize in, in, in um, receiving those complaints and investigating them so that you can maintain the employee confidentiality requirements that you're supposed to, but also address it at the same time? Well, we certainly, we certainly have a procedure um, in place for handling uh, personnel complaints. So, I, what, what is it? Do you want to share that so that I don't the think. actual the actual procedure? Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Bear with me. The reason I'm saying that is because I th I think it, it committees make sense in a lot of ways for different issues, but I know when you know we have a lot of employees, and when people. Uh, make complaints, it has to be done in a way that com complies with the law. So we have like a specialist who's trained in, ha in handling certain kinds of um, issues. And so I was just wondering if a structure like that might make sense yeah, around I mean, particular complaints that you may receive. I don't know. Right. We, we have professional investigators as well, um, you know, who are familiar with, you know, the rules and regs of our department and, um, and, you know, our supervisor are held responsible for, um, you know, upholding all these code of ethics. Everybody's held accountable, or, um, you know, but, in any violence that is observed is addressed. But hold on. Can, can we follow? Like, can we try to approach this from the point of view of an example complaint? Not, I'm not saying give me an example. I'm saying let's let's take a mock. Let's say I'm a I'm a citizen, and I feel that I've been mistreated or rudely treated by a police officer. I had a need and it was uh, disregarded. And so I make this complaint. Let's say I come into the police department and I ask to see you and I make this wait, complaint. Wait, wait, Vince, let me stop you for two seconds. Chief, how does he make the complaint? But don't, don't, don't gloss over that because that's actually one of, the, one of the things that that's been highlighted is, do people feel comfortable making the complaint? So what, 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 is, what are someone's avenues to make a complaint? Vince may feel comfortable walking in. Is there, are there any other options? Thank sure. you, Jill, that's perfect. Um, uh, email or um, a letter. 
any of those options. Is is there isn't there an anonymous portal? Yeah. There is. I was just on the website just now trying to see if there was a, a way to it, but it it's um, provide an anonymous tip, which I don't know if I were wanting to make a complaint about a particular officer that I would read, you know, make an anonymous to be that, tip yeah. as being, you know, the right place to complain, you know, file a complaint about an officer. All right, I'm gonna try to share yeah. this again. Was that intended? to capture anonymous complaints, Chief? Or it was just tips? You know, I, I don't know the initial um, intent, but it certainly could be used for either. But it, so it sounds like we may need or want something that is specific for this issue so that people can have the confidence to know that it's not being mixed in with, I saw someone steal a car or I saw someone break in a house. No, I have still a Still someone saw a steal right. a lawn sign. Or steal a lawn sign, right. right. I, I, I have a personal issue I want to share and, and, and we need to know it doesn't go to some random officer that there's someone designated to that position. Vince, I'm putting words in your mouth. No, but I, I see that because then maybe it's a statement of some kind that says complaints can be done in these ways. These are the these are your options if you would like to file a complaint. If you feel comfortable going to the chief, you can do that. You can write a letter, you can do this. And there is an anonymous complaint something. But Vince, just following not not just letting that go for a second, you know, this community advisory board maybe that's a function for them as well to be able to sort of be a buffer. Because I, I could see where someone is, feels uncomfortable telling the chief about one of his, you know, officers, whether rightfully or wrongfully, um, you know, feels that, that it, maybe it's not going to be given the, the, the attention or the, you know, the attention that it should. So it, is, it, is it possible that perhaps one of the functions of a community advisory board could be to act as that that liaison that that bit of a buffer so that you could take and make a complaint um are you suggesting that still like, though as one of the array of options or the way it's done no 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 one of the array i i i think more the the merrier i think you know people i i i, I don't I don't know how, how comfortable people feel one way or the other, um, because but, but I can understand. I feel like it's not just, um, there's obviously, you know, looking at it from the CRE perspective, you know, Hermian's suggestion and, and Kim's suggestion with regard to, there's people who don't feel comfortable, um, you know, filing a complaint for, for sort of, you know, racial justice reasons, but there's other reasons as well, why people feel nervous about picking up the phone and calling you chief. So, you know, um, people who are volunteers with the ambulance corps or with the fire department or, you know, so people who like work with you all um, sometimes would feel hesitant about, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to be, you know, sort of, <laughs> they don't want to be known, right? They want to be, be able to be anonymous. And so, um, you know, it's not, it's not only for sort of racial justice reasons that somebody might want to be able to have another avenue to file um, an anonymous uh, complaint. So I think um, we're all in agreement that the community um, um, engagement, community partnership is a good idea, right? And maybe part of that, we have a couple of liaison personnel in it that can um, you know, be willing to accept the complaint and then, and then you know, coordinate um, getting together with us or making the complaint. But you know, I think if we all are in favor of the idea, we should take it as part of one of something we want to work on and draft for down the road. Okay. And, and do we... In vision, I'm sorry. I just want to share with you, as someone who operates in a system with anonymous alerts, you, there's a consideration that you need to take into account for your employees and addressing what is written anonymously about them at times. And so you have to balance what is and isn't appropriate to share with a larger community committee when you're handling issues around employment. So that, that, as someone who interacts with that mechanism often, I, I would just sh share that feedback with you. I think anonymous complaints are difficult because you don't have the opportunity to, um, to interview the person and get the specific, so, sorry. So my idea behind it would be they may come to CRE, but CRE, you know, um, or whatever the outreach group is, um, facilitates them making the complaint. However, it makes them more comfortable, whether they meet with me or my lieutenant or whatever. 
it can be doing a much more effective investigation if we actually speak with the person making the complaint. But I think that's an excellent point that just, um, it's, it sounds so simple to say it, like, oh, let's, right. let's set up a, you know, so mm -hmm. not, not, not a CCRB, but a CCRB light mm -hmm. <laughs> organization. But I think Christine's point is really important, which is that we have to be very thoughtful about how we set that up and the charge that we give those people who sit on that board um, and, and what they are and are not sort of authorized to take in and, and how they handle the issues that come before them. I think it's, you know, it sounds simple, but it's not simple. So we just have to be mindful of the fact that it's going to take some work um, to set it up appropriately so that we're um, both uh, respecting the feedback we're going to be getting from people potentially through this avenue, um, but also mindful of the, the rights of the people who, the officers who serve. And, and, our, and with that. But this is something. Mm -hmm. No, what, what, I, what I'd like to say is, let's say, let's say the, uh, the complaint is not anonymous. Let's say mm -hmm. I, I'm comfortable saying I, this happened X, Y, Z day, whatever the details are. And I, I go to the chief. And so what, and I don't know the answer to this, but what is, do I hear back anything? <laughs> like, like, do, like, is the person who's willing to come forward and say, get some, I don't know. Resolution. I don't know. They, they, are, informed, they are informed of the outcome of the investigation. They are informed. It, yes. There are boards like this throughout New York City as well. I, I happen to have uh, been a prosecutor for the former Board of Ethics for New York City, the now Conflicts of Interest Board. And the members on that board, everything is confidential. It, it's mandatory, quite honestly. Every case that we took, uh, because it, it dealt with elected officials and government workers. So um, it was always kept confidential. And it's, it's one of the uh, important tenets of anybody serving on the board. So um, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, we're not talking willy nilly, getting people on a board who are then going to go to a coffee clutch and talk about, oh, gee, this is what I heard. I, they have to. It, they're going to take this seriously. It is um, something that they're 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 being given, and and it's it's very important to keep that integrity going. I mean, for the community as well as the people who come to it, and it's not going to work without that. So, but but this is we don't have to reinvent the wheel. They have um, boards like this all over New York City, and 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 they function this way. Right, but do we want it only to be an ethics board? Is is that is that all? No, I'm just I just. No, I just mentioned uh, the mm -hmm. ethics board because that just happened to be where I was, I had worked for a period of time. Um, but no, this could be for, uh, it could be for ethics issues. It could be for other complaints. Maybe there are racial issues or, um, or maybe there is a complainant who has a relationship with the police officer or someone in the department and, and feels funny going to the police department. It could be for, for any, uh, any uh, number of, of reasons um, that they would not feel comfortable coming to the, the police department directly. I just make a suggestion. Um, perhaps Chief Carroll can ask other communities or other places if they have such places in procedure, and then you know we could tag off what they are doing. I'm sure someone else, some other place, maybe Pleasantville, Mount Kisco, they have something like this already in place. I think we might be surprised to see that we are a lot further along than a lot of the other departments. Um, but it's, you know, that was a proposal that was made by the CRE. Um, and, uh, and, and there are examples, maybe not in our immediate neighborhood, maybe not even within the police um, the, the, the realm of policing, but as Kimberly um, pointed out um, in other agencies that has, that is established. Mm -hmm. So we're not reinventing the wheel. Okay. okay. I, and I, I would be very grateful if we can adopt that. Um, what do people think about the survey of the community? The community survey, anonymous asking, you know, how the community, how, you know, how are we doing? I think surveys are always good as long as the population's not inundated with them. <clears throat> um, 
um, <laughs> but you know, certainly, Fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's always good to get input. And it, I think it's nice for the population to know that they're giving input, whether they want to give their name or not. I, I would suggest this, this one thing, doing a little bit of data work, that, that somebody who, who is a professional in, in, in making surveys. Yeah. Yes. Because, yes. And, yes. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> With, without um, question. Yeah. Is there it ever, be targeted. Has, there been, has there been in the past, um, sir, like for example, I live in Yonkers. I don't live in Chappaqua, but I spend more of my time there than I do at home. Um, and I'm and I'm assuming there are other people in a similar situation to me where I do have an investment in the community as well. Um, and I just wonder if, because I've, nev I've never been asked to participate in a survey or anything having to do with the town of Newcastle. Um, and so as quote unquote an outsider um, who doesn't live in the community, um, I'm just wondering if there is a way to make sure that those who, who have an investment in the community are captured in if there's going to be any kind of survey done. If we decide to go that route, I think we could certainly do that, whether it be the e-newsletter, you know, post it on my website, the town's website, my Facebook page, uh, the town's Facebook page, um, put the sign up in town, you know, we, we can get the message out. Great. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I mean, but I, I love the idea of a, of a community group that service. works and, and interfaces with the, uh, with the department. I, and Chief, I... I I just want to point out one, one thing. In your opening statement, you said the community is the people who live here, the people who work here, and the people who visit here. That's our working definition from the police department. Mm -hmm. So if we, we should, I, I think, follow that. Good point. That's yeah, good point. yeah, excellent. So, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me, by the way? Yes. First yes. Off. Hi. Um, so in regard to this community survey, who exactly are you targeting and how would you get that survey out there? Would that be through the website? Would, um, would there be an actual email sent out to people? How, how would you go about doing that? Again, I think we're getting bogged down in the procedure that we can get to later on. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just think that, hey, you know, a community survey is something that we think is a good idea for the future. And then we can come in how to actually get that done later on. I, just, I have one question about that though, Chief. Are you thinking the community survey is an input to this process or are you thinking that the community survey is sort of an ongoing activity that you'd like to see us doing on you know, an annual or biannual basis so that we're- An annual, biannual basis. Okay, got it, got it, okay. Yeah, I think that's a terrific idea because we're trying to reform and, and give suggestions and that's the way the community stay on top of the, I wanna say the top of community issues with policing. So I think that's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because this process is going to end, but, but, you know, our relationship with the, with the police and the police's relationship with the community is ongoing and it would be nice to, to keep those lines of communication open. I, I want to just check in with Purcell just for a second, because he asked this question about how it would be done. Did you have a concern about how things get done that way? Was that what, what I'm just, my concern is who is this survey? Like, who is it? being sent to is it sent being sent to a general populace is it is it you know because if you put it in a certain place only from my experience surveys are voluntary and a lot of people especially now probably won't find that time to do that survey um i can you know from experience myself um chances are i won't fill out that survey um and i can probably assure you that people um you know in general, uh, might not have that access to the survey to complete or the time or what have you. I was just curious as, as to how it would be how how it would be put out there for everyone. But but that's I love that point because the question is if if we really believe in a survey of some kind, it might require a little more muscle in terms of time and energy to encourage people to fill it out rather mm -hmm. than it be a little more passive. We might need to be a little more active if we really want this information. And Listen, I, I agree that we want to get it out to as many people and maybe people won't do it, but anything we get back that can help us improve, I think, or find, get the pulse of the community or part of the community will be beneficial. 
there are there are numerous ways. I mean, the email blast, the town news, um, even um, uh, at every um, community vendor sale store in in town, they can right. have a number of the surveys. The, all of the houses of worship can have a stack of the surveys for the people who regularly come and visit and experience the town. They'll they'll have access to it, and they can just drop it off. They're, you know, at every given store, wherever they should be able to just put it in a box. Um, and get it picked up, make it easy for them. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. I was just curious. I didn't want to get bogged down in um, you know, in the details. But. No, it's a really good point though. Because Thank you. If, yeah. If if you if you can't if you you're you're unable to circulate it and and get it to the people that that you want to hear from, then you've defeated the purpose. It's it's always a challenge. Yeah. It's always a challenge. And, and my thought would be, you know, that, that the meeting where we have you know identifying the issues, you know, and the, some of the ones we've highlighted will certainly show up there, and then at that point we can assign subgroups. To really look into these things and come up with a plan for us as to how to do it and some language for the draft that's how right. i'm going so so the, the the i'm sorry to keep i don't mean to harp on it but so the community advisory group would would this be a standing con committee that would help us perhaps target the um issues that we would include in the survey i mean that's that's what i was sort of hoping they would help us do you're, you're, you're asking for a committee to deal with this in addition to the group here? No, I was just thinking it, it, it could be something that sort of... I, um, Jill, yes, um, I will tell you that um, CRE had put together a really comprehensive survey, um, community survey. Actually, it was so comprehensive that at one point we had broken it out into um into couple different surveys um angela i think angela broner helm is actually the the keeper of that information right now so there is in fact a working document i know from my team kimberly and sunu and eugene song had put together a survey on policing um, so we do we do have a, a, a working document so already that we can review and continue to build on. Awesome. That's great. We are ahead. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, sorry, okay, I'm, I'm done with my questions. <laughs> that can't be the only questions. I'm sure there's more. Not not necessarily from you, Jill. I mean, it could be. <laughs> I guess the the um, one question, and, and I can't remember which slide it's on. Um, the chief mentioned about whether or not quotas we expect people to be productive, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering what that means. What 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 does it mean to be pr a productive police officer? I expect officers, if they observe, say, a vehicle and traffic violation, to pull the person over um, and either uh, educate or uh, write a summons to. Um, we also have chronic areas where guys are required every day to um, go in and target for a speeding area like uh, 117 by the um, Old Bedford Road by the Country Club. That's one where they would be expected to perform speed enforcement at that location maybe for a half hour or an hour during the day, and they are expected to address any violations that they occur, that, that they would see. So that's that's what, you know, does everybody have to be issued this? I mean, no, I, I've said it before that sometimes um, a car stop can be a, a good um, opportunity, community policing opportunity where an officer and, and uh, the public can interact and, and um, you know, a warning could be issued. That's a good yeah. question to follow up to what Martha mm -hmm. just said. Um, is there a mechanism for, for those who do or don't know where even if you don't issue a summons, you can see whether or not an officer stopped the vehicle and let the vehicle proceed on its way. Are they required, for example, to write down a, a registration so that you know that someone's doing their job or doing their due diligence? Not that you're saying you have to have a certain number of cars stopped and a certain number of cars, uh, it, uh, pardon me, drivers summonsed, but it's a way for you to, to see that they're actually, someone's actually doing that particular job. Um, yes, officers are required to um, call out the plate, the description of the vehicle, and their location. They're also supposed to enter it in, in the computer with, uh, you know, uh, the plate number and uh, some warning issue, summons issued, and um, 
or none? Uh, yeah, warning issued summonses. Warning. Sorry, sorry. Can I just speak? Jim, to do you second? track the demographic? Oh, I, oh. I, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, can I just speak to that? Um, with respect to those stops, um, one of the things, and I may be getting ahead of us a little bit, but I, from yeah. past understanding, um, I, that has to be, um, I think, a little bit um, more detailed because my understanding is when those stops are made, we don't take any demographical information uh, about the person being stopped. And I know, I know, I understand that there are certain stops that are made by the county police. Obviously, that has to be dealt with through the state, and I think a recommendation should be sent to the state that those particular tickets, et cetera, um, are redrafted to. Um, include demographical information because we don't we need to know that to know if there really is some bias going on but in town uh, even when officers do have these stops and uh, they let them go with a warning or what have you we need some uh, data as to who was stopped basic information about them or we're not going to really be able to get ahead of any potential issue or how do we even address if if somebody does ultimately complain that there is bias inherent in the system, we don't have that information to counter with. If you say it doesn't exist, we need that information. So I think that's a, a, a definite change that we really need to employ. Um, as as for individual stops, um, you know, we don't we don't track race. I think um, you know. Is it is it something to do or not? yes? Um, will, it, will it be favorable by officers? No. Would it make them actually be less productive? Possibly. Um, it's something you know we have to consider. I do know this that um, you know we can. The courts are going to be required, uh, starting I, I think I don't know if it's this year or next year to be um, compiling stats on um, the race of um, by of summonses. So I, I'm not sure how that happens, but I actually haven't have it addressed in the, the legislation in section three, which we'll talk about next month. But all right, well, I, I guess that should just be reinforced in whatever recommendations we make, just to say, look, you know, we find it valid. Yep. Um, but can I just in in response to that that comment, why would listing demographics such as race you make know. an officer <laughs> less productive? That con that language concerns me. Yeah, you know, I can't speak to you. Some officers find it very distasteful to make a summons, write a summons or pull over a car in general on anything you add to it would just possibly uh, could have a negative impact. But, uh, you know, that's well, something for me to deal with. Um, but, God, turn. Well, I think the follow up to that, I mean, it's, you know, do, do you ask the officer to assume someone's race? Because I think in some cases, well, they could be of mixed race, they could have different ethnic racial backgrounds, you know. so. Where do you class other, I mean, some people identify as different, we all know we all, people identify different ways. Right. So there's that also the complicated issue too. And, you know, you could be of a, a background and everyone has different skin tones, even within a particular ethnic background. So I mean, how do you, you know, sort of- I wonder how that's done with departments that do collect that data. So do they, do they ask, do they say, would you be willing to volunteer this information or do they make a, and then I yes. guess I have a question as to whether, are, are we, is it legal? Are you allowed to ask? I, d I, don't, I don't know the answer. But, well, it's on, it's on rap sheets, the race of a person. That's different. It's on the license. Yeah. You can look at the license. Uh, I don't, no, that's not on the license. It's, it's not on the license? No. You know, oh, I would I say this, though, that you, know, you can't tell race um, at night. Um, you know, if a car is speeding past, it's very difficult. So the, you know, you know, while I'm sure there is issues and there are certain people who are, you know, um, making stops because of race, you know, I'd like to think that we don't have that problem, but I appreciate the idea behind this. So, race is on the driver's license, by the way. Is that yes. nice? It is, especially if you have an enhanced yeah. driver's I'm gonna, I'm gonna license. I'm going to put my license out. Oh, we're all going for our license right license. now. I don't have any. Yeah. It's, 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 it's there. Down. I, find I, I my have license. mine. It's, it's here. Christine, you're driving right now still. Can you take a look at that license? I am not. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I, already. I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, I. I'm not seeing it. Um, I'm not seeing it if you have an enhanced driver's license, uh -huh. the line above issued is. It says R for race and a B for black. 
Yeah, but but mine real. says R B, and I'm not black. <laughs> I, I have an I have an enhanced license, and mine does not say Hispanic. What does but it say? R must mean something else then. Well, I, I'm not seeing. Uh, uh, I'm not. What, where should I be looking? Um, on the very the line over issued. Yeah, get my license. <laughs> um, be right back. It's there is a I unless it's mis, I'm mistaken, but I always thought the R was race and the B yeah. was for black. I I, I, I and, <laughs> Um, yeah, let me find I'm out. I may have misspoken. As, as, as we look through this, I think the important issue is whether it's there or not. You know, is, is, do we ask people how does it make people? You know, how how would you feel if someone's saying, "Well, what what is your race?" If 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 you, it's not easily or readily identifiable, and even if it is readily identifiable, how are you identifying yourself? So I just you know, you talk about making someone feel uncomfortable. You know, I don't have to deal with that, but I would imagine if an officer let you go but how to lodge your race yeah that's weird Ooh, it just seems that's, a little yeah. mine doesn't have it i mine says rb so does mine <laughs> but okay so maybe i am mistaken what the r stands that's fine, for. but but look i think the point is that it's difficult i think some people might be offended if if they're asked to identify um and i think also just the, the you know like the, does it does it make officers a little bit more apprehensive um, when they're doing their jobs where they're now having to report a person's race and maybe they might be concerned that they're going to be uh, targeted for discrimination. Um, you know, I think, I think as far as um, the, the criminal justice system goes, they do have to get that information because it identifies the person, you know, it helps with tracking criminals. Uh, and the more we have, uh, the better that that is. But I don't know. I think I think we get into some tricky areas when when we have officers trying to guess. Like I don't, you know, no, some people might think I'm Hispanic. Most might, but you know, at night I they could think I'm something else. So I don't know. I think it's a little tricky. I I would just say one thing about that. Um, it's tricky. I'm not saying it isn't or anything like that. However, if and and this happened to me. I've been pulled over, um, speeding. Uh, I was rushing somebody to the hospital had an asthma attack. He let me go. He didn't write me a summons. Uh, seemed totally, totally Nash, uh, reasonable. He was reasonable. Everything went fine. Um, however, people can be pulled over. And the question would be, are the white people let, being let go and the people of color getting summonses? And how would we know? So I just, since we are talking about the conversation of stopping people and because I want to keep it real and unless we have these real conversations, I don't think um, it would help this reform committee. Uh, one of the things my friends who move to the area and who are black or who are black, uh, one of the things we always ask them is, have you introduced yourselves to the local police so that they know that you've moved to the area and if you're a black man, you won't be stopped by them and asked, where are you going? They don't assume that you live here. And, uh, you know, so, so I just want to keep it real and say that we always like, there's someone I know, a new couple who moved here and, you know, he's a young black boy. And I asked him, I was like, hey, did you stop by? And obviously I got to know him well enough before I asked the question. I didn't want him to think I was crazy and just be like, hey, you need to introduce yourself to the local police, but you know, when once I got to do, I kind of casually asked that question. Um, so I just want to let you all know that we can have these conversations which don't really, you know, which you all don't hear about, but these are the kind of conversations we do have. And we do worry about young black boys in the area, not only Chappaqua, but Pleasantville, Mount Kisco, Hornwood. So, that's the kind of conversations which happen. So, you know, I, I think it's important that you'll know about these things. I want and to I think add... it's really important that we find a way that we find a way to, to actually get this information. Well, the only way that's going to happen is if uh, at stops, if there's some category to check off for for race. Right. So that is that to be changed. 
Right. So that did was... you and Hermian, or, or Hermian, did you, did you guys start when you wrote this recommendation for the CRE, mm -hmm. had you done any research into how to implement this or how other places have, I mean, I, certainly we're not the only people who have, you know, tried to tackle this question. Right. And um, one of the big things for us was because, for example, my understanding from my conversation with Chief Carroll is that the sermons and tickets um, come down from the state. And we thought, what a great opportunity that since this is now a state mandate, then we do have an opportunity to actually get that information included at the state level without much pushback. Um, because trying to change it on a local level, we won't be able to do it, but it can be done at the state level. So this is our opportunity to get that proposal um, passed by including it in our list of recommendations. But the, the stops that are done in town by our local police and they're let go, um, Chief Carroll, I forget what you call them, stop notes or something like that. Um, I think it's important to denote that information there as well, not just on the state issued tickets, whatever the local um, uh, documentation is for the local police. It's the only way we can stay ahead of it. I I think I, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable um, because I, I don't know that I would want my friends to be at who are stopped, who happen to get yeah. stopped, to be asked what, you know, what, what's your race, what's your culture, uh, when there's, when they're then being told, okay, have a nice evening. Um, you know, I, 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 that to me, I, I would worry about that. You know, I mean, it, it's like somebody saying to me, well, what's your sexual orientation? And then saying, oh, okay, have a good evening. Wait, um, but you know, I just, I just feel like I have to put, and maybe I, I'm wrong, but I just mm -hmm. feel like I have to push back on that mm -hmm. a little bit. I don't know that, I, I don't think that that's a comfortable thing to ask anybody. Um, any kind of personal information, once you've said, you know, here's your license and registration back, you know, just be really careful and have a good, you know, be safe. Oh, and by the way, what's your nationality or what's your race or, or what's your sexual orientation? I mean, that to, that to me just feels really, really weird to do well, that. That's Here's valid. the other question. We're having pushback it's an objective saying issue. this a, a, isn't a happening. I'm sorry. I understand the reasoning behind it, Hermione. I just am not, I just don't know what the answer is that people are not going to get upset and think they're being targeted because uh, uh, because of the color of their skin, right? Uh, you know that I'm. Why am I being asked this question um, when I when they're telling me have a nice evening and go on your way? I mean, I I guess that's what I'm just concerned that um, that well, someone will feel targeted because well, they're know, being you know, asked. Margaret that's all. And more, I, thought, mm -hmm. I, I think I think this really is an issue where you, you, you just you just got to it why they're being stopped okay so I'm not sure that it's a question that needs to be asked of the person I think it needs to be in the description of the stopping officer because it's the perception of the stopping officer that is going to uh, give us the information quite honestly well, that's what we're looking at. I mean, you're right. I, I, I but what if it's inaccurate? You know, plenty of people. I didn't. It may be I, inaccurate, I but matter. you know what? It, you you could be. Um, you know, all it could be inaccurate, but that doesn't matter. It's the perception of the officer stopping the person. If you could, let's say that that you're not black, you're you just came back from Argentina in the middle of their summer and you happen to tan really well. If the officer is perceiving you as black and writes it down and you got stopped and we see a, a litany of situations, you know, a, a, a category of, of stops that way, then that's something to be concerned about. Do you see what I'm saying? So it really is the perception of the, the stopping officer rather than the accuracy of the demographic. 
I, okay. I understand what you're saying, I, and I, I don't hear, necessarily I hear disagree what you're with saying. that. Okay. So, and while working on the CRE, on the uh, CRE, we got a lot of pushback, even from people who were volunteering on the CRE, on the CRE, basically saying, ah, there aren't many racial incidents in town. And when you look at the demographic, that's the way it appears, because um, people of color are not rushing to report their negative interactions. Um, right. A, there is no support system in place for people like that, or there has not been until now. Um, and B, they're generally afraid of retaliation. Whereas, um, you know, there are several reports of anti-Semitic incidents. And, you know, those are people who largely feel supported supported by the community, supported by um, their place of worship, etc. So um, on, on the other hand, you know, and this is quite anecdotal, um, I received a, a traffic ticket, right? Uh, I, I confused my um, registration uh, thing. Apparently one of them has a specific date when it expires and the other one expires in a month, you know? Yeah. Um, so I thought I had until the end of the month to renew and so happened it expired a week before the month was up. So off I go to town hall to say boo-hoo, poor me. I'm going to die of poverty from $25 out of my pocket. So there I showed up and I would say out of the people streaming in and out of town hall on that Thursday evening, 75% of the people were people of color, right? Right. Is this, right. Um, do we have 75% of population within Chappaqua, within Newcastle of people of color? I do understand that we also process stops from the sawmill that might be coming from the state police and it might not entirely be Newcastle police. But when we, as, as informal as that observation might be, as anecdotal as it might be, what is influencing um, this huge disparity in, in terms of sermonses and, um, and, and people who are arrested and actually showing up in cuffs, who are people of color versus white people. I mean, I, I see- I have, a, I have a comment. Oh, good, because you call us to the yeah, town. Yeah, if I, if I could um, just push back a little bit. I'm, I'm the town prosecutor. So um, I'm charged with prosecuting town code violations and anything uh, involving the VTL that is not driving while intoxicated. And I, I, like you said, we do process tickets for the state police. We get a lot of them for the Taconic. And um, we also have um, people in town. And, and I've seen white mothers getting cell phone tickets. They're the, they're the biggest uh, culprit there. <clears throat> I've seen, I've never seen a pattern where 75% of the crowd was black or Hispanic. I, I, uh, I see, Officers ticketing white, black, Hispanic, Middle Eastern, Asian, Indian people. Um, one of our more, more prolific um, summons writers, uh, Joseph Evans. Uh, I've had uh, numerous uh, trial preps with him. And on every, any given night, I'll have five different people from five different walks of life and no pattern. Um, women, older women, younger women, white women, um, white men. Um, so I, I just have to push back a little bit. Uh, and, you know, maybe you were there on a day where, you know, maybe there was some weird thing with the scheduling, but I can tell you that as a person of color myself, if I saw these officers uh, targeting people of color for their skin versus for the fact that they were speeding or on the cell phone, I would personally raise that matter uh, myself to the chief. And I think we have a very diverse uh, police force here. Um, we have uh, black 
We have Hispanic officers, more so than I think the NYPD, um, which is interesting because of, of the demographics of this town. And you know, people are driving through from the city, from down, from upstate, and they just happen to get caught speeding. And it just happens to be a person of color or a white person. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any patterns. So I just wanted to push back a little bit on that. And well, Carlos, and that's I, fine for people who have had tickets, but I mean, that doesn't talk to, that doesn't speak to the numerous people who we know um, definitively who are simply stopped on a regular basis and they happen to be people of color. They don't get the tickets, so they don't have to appear in town courts. Okay, and that's well, why I, even I mean, if you stop- I've never been pulled over in this town, but I understand it happens. I think we have one of the better forces. I'm, I'm happy to say that. I, I, um, you know, I don't do this mm -hmm. for any other reason than I, I want to somehow give back to the community. And this is what I choose to do with my time. In fact, I'll have, I'll have, I'll have to hop off in about a half an hour because I have a hearing tonight in, in town uh, court that I need to appear in. But um, I guess I just want to push back because I think our, our officers are doing a good job and I'm not seeing any particular pattern. Uh, again, if they're stopping people of color and not writing them summons, I never find out about that. So I can't really comment on that. Um, I can just comment about what I've seen and my personal experiences. Right, Carlos. And I, I, um, I respect your um, view on that. I also hold um, what I saw um, yeah, that's fair. as evidence. The, the meat of this conversation is that we have no verifiable way of quantifying that data because it's not something that's captured. Um, so there is that aspect to it. I also want to ask if we do see a pattern um, if, um, coming out of the state police stops, what do we have in place um, to push back on them to, for example, recommend greater diversity training to them. Um, I do want to acknowledge what you said, that Newcastle police might be better than most. But I think at this juncture in time, we're not just looking for good enough. We're looking to be exceptional. Can I say that, um We've identified that to some people, this certainly is an issue, and, and it's certainly something we should move on to that um, that next phase where we should come back and discuss it, and then maybe we can you know, continue with the section two. I do. I withdraw my uh, my concern. It's been addressed. Thank you. Um, and just an aside, I went on the application for the New York State driver's license because I am intrigued as to what R is asking, <laughs> and. Um, they don't ask race on the application. What does R stand for? I don't know. I can't find it either. I'm, I'm looking I'm, at I'm so confused. Right it now. says the, E and the R, R. The, the R, this is purse elegance, sorry. Um, yeah, no. The R on the back stands for restrictions. So if you're wearing lenses oh. like glasses or anything like that, they put a code there. So it's B if you are, I don't know why they say, you know, but yeah, there's an, yeah, yeah, there's an E and an R restriction. Yeah. Okay. Bye, All right. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, <Bifocals. laughs> Yeah. I'm upset <clears throat> now. Oh, maybe. So I, yeah, I but they don't ask my yeah. statement that race is on the driver's license. We're all more alike than we thought. <laughs> yeah, I retract <laughs> that. <I'm> new today. <laughs> and before we move on, I just want to second what Carlos said. I, I was the town prosecutor from 2010, 2016. I did not notice a pattern any greater and what Carlos is describing, um, and, and at least in terms of those who can speak English as their first language, it would have been more of an issue for me needing an interpreter to, to, to manage those, those matters, and it was few and far between, although certainly I think almost with regularity there'd be somebody, but I'm, I did not see over that 10 to 2016 the things that you're mentioning, Hermian, uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but 70% I think is is an astronomically higher number than, than what we have seen as prosecutors. Yeah, um, and mind you, I said 70% per people of color. I didn't say 70% black. And I think that was um, something Carlos said, and um, I just need to correct that. All right, procedural justice training. Has anybody, I not think that's a great idea that we're moving forward with that, so. Um, Hey, Jim, 
Yeah. I have a question. So you know how when there are certain incidents that happen and you have a specialist to come and respond, like if there's a sexual assault um, or if there's a, a, like a dispute in a family, do you have like a specialist officer that would res respond if there was a bias incident in, in the same kind of a way? Um, we, no, we, we don't. Um, we, we, all our officers are trained to handle every um, incident in town. So the, the uh, patrolman would go take the initial response, re initial report. Then it would, depending on the incident, be turned over to our detective division who would uh, investigate it. Um, if, if, if there was a serious crime where they needed to call in, a, you know, um, you know, they process most scenes, but like a murder, we would call in um, the county lab to do it, you know, so mm -hmm. we, we do go to outside house, but no. Well, does it, I don't, I don't know, so this is why I'm asking, does it make sense to um, designate someone to respond to certain incidents and, and give them a, a, a specialized type of training? Like we would if, if, if there was a student who was sexually assaulted, there's certain, um, there's certain people that respond to that because they have that kind of specialized training. I, I, don't, I don't know, that, that's what I'm asking. It was just one thing I was thinking about. Yeah, I mean, for, for something like that, again, the procedure would be the same. The patrolman comes, takes the response, the report, the detective would come follow up, the detective if necessary would call the um, you know, Child Advocacy Center to help with the interview, possibly depending on the age, but I don't have, you know, I, I can't guarantee that I have an officer working that the time that a, a bias incident happened or a hate crime happened. Yeah, I think this came up last week and I think uh, I mentioned in, in, in the manual, they, they were uh, mentioning some places in Europe and a couple of states here where they have people that are trained especially to deal with like a mental health situation which um, I know we're dealing with one right now in town, uh, which has uh, uh, turned into a criminal matter. And, you know, you, you have to wonder whether, um, you know, having perhaps at the county level would, would make more sense, having people trained specially to, uh, to show up at these mental health uh, situations or scenes, um, you know, without sirens, without lights. <clears throat> But I, I think it would be very costly and I think it would probably make more sense to raise it at the county level. So, but we should certainly, um, you know, make, make that recommendation. So yeah. it's interesting Chief, you should say that. Chief, do you want to talk about the uh, seminar from today? What's that? Oh. Uh, Did you, you want know, to talk about the seminar today? Otherwise I can. You can, I, I just want to tell, tell I actually yeah. had a chief's meeting today with, um, and I happen to be with the, um, Commissioner of Department of Public Safety, and I, oh. I brought up to him the whole idea of the crisis team again, and he said that he's he is aware that um, the county exec has put aside money to try to start funding that again going forward. Right, because evidently in larger cities they do have it, and in Westchester County itself has, um, you know, this this crisis interventions um, that you know because they they acknowledge the fact that that you know mental a mental health incident is not necessarily and is not at first blush a um, a criminal incident but yet your police officers are your first responders and they're the ones that are on the scenes and they're the ones that have to deal with it initially and so how to take and bifurcate that that process um before it ever starts so that the responding person is a mental health professional as opposed to a a police officer and Evidently, they're doing it effectively in larger cities like White Plains, but they don't have anything for the smaller municipalities. And clearly, you know, we don't have the, the, um, the level that would warrant, let's say, our own, you know, mental health professional who would be there 24-7 that could respond, but maybe it's a shared service. Maybe, it, you know, something like that where among, you know, neighboring towns, we could take and create something like that. Again, uh -huh. to, to be able to channel... Uh, mental health um, crises away from the criminal justice system instead right. of, you know, capturing it in the same net. I think that might be a recommendation that's coming out of the county. Uh, they're, they're doing the same thing we're doing for the mm -hmm. county police, and they've, they've started earlier, so they're a little further along, but I think that's something that may be coming where they're going to suggest that there be regional crisis teams yes. respond to incidents. Yes. Yeah. I'm told that so is it's in the works. 
so it makes sense that we should actually promote that in our recommendations yes. to, um, yes. you know, to uh, segue right. with and, that. And, right. and actually, you know, it's, it's interesting. They were talking about the fact that it's almost a zero intercept. So it's before 911. So right. instead of calling 911, mm -hmm. which is the police response, there right. is a mental health one response. One. Yes. 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 So that you, you know, because once you channel it into 911, the operator is going to respond as a police emergency. Exactly. As opposed to a mental health emergency. But again, that, that you know, it, that puts the onus on the caller to be able to properly identify it. And sometimes, you know, everyone's impulse yeah. is a 911. And so it goes. But it, it's an interesting concept going forward. Well, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, when I'm thinking about the incident that just happened in September, where that 13 year old boy with autism, who was known to be, you know, he, he would respond by screaming and running and uh, the, the mother had had called 911 saying I just need somebody to come and deescalate he's he's autistic, and he tends to scream and run and he ended up being shot 13 year old boy. Um, because it, it takes special training to now, mm -hmm. this isn't technically mental health, but in a, in a way it, it's in that field, if you will, um, in that area, but a specially trained person could have properly de-escalated that with that special training. Um, and, and just, you know, not our officers have a lot to deal with. Yes. Um, and you can't expect them to, you know, be doctors and lawyers and nurses and on top of everything else they're dealing with. So um, this is serious and it can escalate. I think that would be a good recommendation. And I think I mentioned last week, you know, even if there is a, 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 regional, a regional group that would um, formulate this, you know, that, that would form this, it, it, it could actually be distributed among the county similar to the DA's offices where they have offices in certain towns so that they have people who can respond relatively quickly compared to mm -hmm. everybody coming out from White Plains. So. Okay, um, Chief, um, if I may, before we move on, um, remaining in the section we're in for um, just once for a few more minutes, um, from reading the, the, from the outset of section two, um, section two, paragraph one, procedural justice and community policing, um, in addressing the law enforcement code of ethics. Um, you read, as a law enforcement officer, my fundamental duty is to serve mankind, to save God lives and property, to protect the innocent against deception, the weak against oppression and intimidation. And it continued. One of the things that came to mind was just um, a really common practice in policing um, during questioning where it is acceptable. As a matter of fact, I think the law explicitly allows the police to lie and deceive um, people who they are interrogating. And I am looking for um, the specific law and, and having a hard time coming up with it. But I think it's quite okay. It, um, it's, it's quite common practice for someone to say, oh, this person said X, Y, Z, um, while trying to elicit a confession. Um, I, I would like for you to respond to that because to me, this is not in, this practice is not in keeping um, with the policies that promote procedural justice? It's called subterfuge. Um, maybe That's Harvey can it. talk about it. Yeah. Um, uh, Hermione, um, Hermione. The standard, did, did I mispronounce your name? It's Hermione. It's okay. Hermione. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the standard in um, statements, confessions, generally is, was the person's free will overborn? Um, the police, of course, have to give uh, a suspect Miranda rights before anything happens. Uh, but all of these concepts, it's, it's very new. It gets very nuanced. Uh, police, uh, in some circumstances, can lie, and that will not invalidate a confession. But it's really a case-by-case case -case basis you have to look at. Right. 
So let's. And wouldn't, the, and wouldn't the court decide whether or not it was um, over the it's top? Ulti it's ultimately up to a judge, sure. Right. If 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 you're going to pursue that, I mean, I think vic victims of crimes, um, and depending on the crime, would certainly um, want us to uh, maybe use tactics and interrogation techniques that we can to solve it. Um, but no, we should be crossing the line and should be judged. I, I'm particularly thinking about the case of the Central Park Five, right, or the Exonerated Five, as as they're they're now known, and several other more recent. Um, I'm very involved with the Innocence Project, and basically on a daily basis, you're seeing people who have served twenty, thirty years behind bars um, being released. So yes, there is a um, uh, a fairness to the victim, there is also, um, there should be fairness to protect the innocent as well. And um, the introducing um, that subterfuge is, what, what can we do to, um, Mr. Loeb, um, Harvey, who responded to me, is that something that's coming from the state level? Is that a federal um, a federal law? Is that a state law? Well, uh, the standard I gave you was defined by court, court decisions. Okay. Um, as was um, Miranda rights originally. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's evolved by hundreds of, hundreds of court decisions that free will being overborne. But, uh, you know, but I, I don't see this as really a major problem in Newcastle. It's hard for me to believe that our police officers are are duping people uh, into making false confessions. Right. And I go and I go back to personnel selection and training and you know supervision as well as as fundamentals to, to try to make sure stuff like this doesn't happen. And and I I respectfully um, I. I honor what you've said. However, are we comfortable sitting here in a little privileged bubble while not addressing what we know is happening on a, on a really wide scale? Um, yes, I do understand that the mandate is just for our tongue, but as I shared last week, um, I know there are many, many places where people are, are, are just being quite performative um, about this. It's a box to check off um, without really trying to effect any meaningful change. I remember um, being a college student when Nelson Mandela was released from prison right at the abolition of, um, of um, apartheid in South Africa. And I remember a committee was formed and, and I might be off because we're, we're literally talking back in the ice age now, but it was called something like the Council of Truth and Reconciliation. And um, it was a time to sit down and look at the systems of injustice that kept people in oppression. Um, I think we are being very disingenuous um, by saying this doesn't happen in our little pocket and we don't have the responsibility to address it. Um, I invite you to look beyond that and to say, yes, it is going on. What I would like the outcome of this conversation to be, to say, whereas we might not be guilty of that in Newcastle on any large scale. This is something we would like to see abolish within policing in general. I, I you know, it's, you know, I think to, to I what Harvey that. said and what Chief said, and I do think we have to stay, stick, relatively speaking, to the task, which is here. Those bigger issues certainly are relevant because you're right; uh, it, it goes beyond us. But you know, I think we could probably debate this for a long time because you would find someone like me who would say. You know what? I think it's okay. You know, assuming that the law is followed. And again, I'm a prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. I've worn both hats. Um, you know, if someone is going to lie to find a missing person uh, and actually locate that person, or, or a firearm, or something dangerous, uh, 
you know, or a domestic situation to protect the, to protect a party. Absolutely. The police are permitted to do it within reason. So I, I don't think a sweeping rule would, would be something that I would support. But that being said, I don't think that's something for us to tackle here, even if it is something that we can tackle as part of a bigger conversation. So my other, my follow-up question would be how, how is policing done in other parts of the world where those techniques are not employed? You know, are we, are we settling for sloppy work um, over something that has more integrity? How do we know they're not being done elsewhere? Um, I, I know that, for example, in the Scandinavian countries, they're not being, that's not being a strategy that's being employed. You know, you know. Again, I think that we we need to look at Newcastle, and I'm just trying to keep us oriented here. We can argue whether or not if an officer says, "Listen, I found the gun in the back seat of the car," and tell us you know, where where you got it, and they didn't find the firearm yet, whatever it may be, there are ways that this is relevant. It's part of this process, um, and it's a court's decision to determine whether or not it was acceptable within the legal terms. But we could probably discuss just this topic the entire time. Uh, of this, uh, with this committee. So I think it's important that we really try to at least stick for now initially as to issues here we want to address. And if, and if we don't have that many collars or part of the arrests in Newcastle where this is employed or as part of this conversation, then I think we should be moving to something that is directly specific here. I don't know, like, because <laughs> what you're really saying, your example right there, uh, Jeremy, is really powerful. Like. If somebody, if a, if a police officer said, I found the drugs in your back seat, you better cop to it now, like, and it's not true? Is that, are we saying in the policies of Newcastle that police officers can lie directly to people under suspicion or like that as a way to kind of intimidate a confession, to get them to say something that could be used against them? Are we okay? I, I, I am absolutely okay with a court ultimately deciding whether or not that, and this is what I do for a living, whether that threshold was broken or met. Um, you know, and it depends what's being said. You know, it is a critical tool. I've seen it used to advantage with, with regularity and, and the times that it's not appropriate, then there'll be a remedy for it. So I, I again, for me personally, this is just my opinion and we're talking obviously open here. I support the police to be able to use those tools with the court system to ensure the integrity of whatever is done. So yes, right. I do support it. And it's, it's no different than sending someone in as an undercover cop, uh, posing as a drug addict to buy drugs to get some bad guy or girl off the street. Um, uh, courts have routinely allowed for that to happen. Uh, in fact, in that situation, it's absolutely necessary to lie because otherwise your life is at risk. And just a little bit of, a little bit sort of like more of what happens in real life. First of all, um, I prosecuted for four years. Obtaining confessions to deception is like one, probably the most difficult thing to do. First of all, most people don't confess. Getting a confession from someone is extremely difficult. I may have gotten three confessions out of the thousands of cases that I prosecuted. And lying to these people was certainly not a tool we used. So I think that the, the Central Park Five, horrible, horrible, what happened to them, extremely rare. Um, you know, the same way that most police officers don't kill people by putting a knee to their neck until they stop breathing. These are very extreme, extreme and very rare incidents. And I don't think that um, they're that much of an issue in general. Forget about Newcastle. So. You know, I think we could certainly recommend stuff and keep it open, but I, I just want to put some people at ease that it's not happening like all the time. You know, this is like every 50 years is a Central Park Five. Uh, you know, um, there's a lot that of people again. in prison though that, <laughs> come, come on. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people in prison who have been, you know, it's being shown that they, were wrongly convicted. That's what the whole Innocence Project. No, I know, and and you're taking like one percent of one percent of where that's happened. Um, I think I would I would argue that ninety nine percent of the people plus that are in prison are there because they actually committed a crime. That is not. That I'm is not aware of a Newcastle uh, case that's got overturned because of a 
um, forced confession or a lying confession? You know, I, I think a different remedy to address this in part would be, for example, videotaping all confessions so that if there is, as someone would call a lie or misrepresentation, there is a video of what occurred so that a, a body, whether it's a jury or a judge, can ultimately determine the validity and legality of, well, a judge would determine the legality, but the legality of that confession, what was done. So that's not stripping a tool away. That's just giving another set of eyes to make sure something was done properly. That, that is in our rules of rights, Jeremy. Right. So that's what I'm saying. So there, there, are, there are measures or means to address it without stripping away that ability that didn't necessarily exist 10, 15, 20 years ago. I agree. I would yeah, I mean, like I, for I, us to um, place this on the Google board for further discussion. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I think that's fair. Absolutely. Thank you. I agree. I'm, I'm going to go through slides and when I get to one that people want to talk about, and I'm sure there's a couple coming uh, up. There actually hot. is. I, I'm Just sorry. There are a couple <laughs> more I want to mention. <laughs> yeah. So can I, I, I think maybe very shortly I'll be getting to some. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Uh, this is one I, when you gave your presentation, Chief, um, I actually don't necessarily agree with the fact that the broken windows doesn't exist <laughs> in Newcastle. Really? <laughs> um, maybe not under you, maybe not. I haven't heard of an example, certainly within the past year, but I have heard of examples of this happening in Newcastle. And it doesn't get reported because it's usually a person of color who is on that end of it. Uh, and they're not going to come to the police and complain because they won't want to be on the police police department's radar at all. This happens, and I've heard this from more than one person. Now it has I can't tell you it's within your reign. I, I, I have not heard of a single no, example awesome. since you've taken it, but I, I can tell you before you came on, it has happened. But what and like Kim, what, oh, okay. Kim, I think you can I think you have to give an example. I think yeah, you're know, just saying. Sure. It happened. Okay. I think we need to know, like, what, what do you mean when you say broken windows policing is You're happening? You're right. I'm sorry. Yes. What that means basically is a police officer starts following somebody uh, and eventually stops them for some innocuous reason or some uh, real false reason. And then the reasons change just so because they may suspect this person um, of, of a crime but they don't have any evidence of it. Right. That's not this broken windows happened. theory. That's, that's not broken windows theory. Well, they say, no, I, 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 the broken windows is, oh, well, you know, the, the license plate, I think that might be stolen or, or you know, some right. other. That's not what's broken windows. Broken windows is like uh, right. enforcing a turnstile jumping um, leads to further um, problems and leads to more serious crime. You're talking about pretextual stops. Pre I'm sorry, pretextual stops. I apologize. Yes, pretextual stops. That's what I'm talking about. Um, that does happen, uh, or it has happened. I haven't heard of any examples in the last year, but I have heard of examples prior to a year ago. Well, and, I'm glad you, you haven't know, heard it, of it recently. <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean, it, you know, but, but the thing is, it, it, it has a chilling effect on a particular segment of the population. It just adds to the lack of trust. And, you know, even if it happens to only 0.5% of the population, it shouldn't be happening. And I think it's something, you know, that we really should address and say, that's just not okay. That's so just not okay. Where are we addressing it if we don't think it's happening under um, my watch? Well, that's a good question. That's, that's, that's a good question. I'm sorry? I, I would support what you're saying. I still think whether it happened, has happened under your watch doesn't mean it can't happen under exactly. your watch. Exactly. So it should still um, be an issue. We I think maybe that goes back to our whole um, uh, reporting of um, uh, personnel complaints, right? That the ability to report less something like that so it could be looked into to make sure it you know, doesn't happen or wouldn't continue to happen and hopefully didn't happen. Chief, if if such a complaint, such an incident took place, say, nine, ten years ago, is there any way to find out, to, to research that in your system? Um, I've reviewed all the complaints as part of a recent um, 
police reform when the revealing of um, 58 was for protection to uh, police personnel records. And I did not see anything indicating that that, that was reported. So the, we're not talking about complaints against a police officer for that. If there was a pretextual stop, would it be in your system whether or not it was reported? No. It would not be in your system? No. Okay. <laughs> And so, and therefore that goes back to the point that Kimberly is making, the fact that certain people are intimidated um, to come forward and make complaints. By the way, I was the person in Kimberly's example um, about the pretextual stop. So, um, but I never, I never filed a formal report about it. <clears throat> So it's once again with it's without the complaints, it's difficult to say that it's not happening. Right. And, and again, I, you know, it goes back to our community hopefully outreach program. If, so, if that's something we decide to go forward with. Right, but it also has to be an issue of training and and how you know what is okay for the police officers to pursue and you know what methods they shouldn't be pursuing. Uh, just because they might have some slight suspicion and, 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 and use some false reason for stopping, it, it, they have to be taught not to do that. It, it's really downgrading the trust that um, a segment of the population has with the, with, the, with the police department. So, and this is, again, you know, it's not, I, I haven't heard of anything since you've gone on, but it doesn't mean it's not, it couldn't happen in the future. Uh, or what happens, you know, when, when you decide you don't want to be chief anymore. I don't, I, you know, who knows? But these are, these are um, recommendations we're making so that we can move forward. This is, you know, we can move forward with a nice slate of uh, um, policies. I, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm listening and I can't help but think to myself, and I mean, at, at some point when you feel comfortable, I really wish you would just pull chief aside because without him knowing the details, of what it is you're talking about. I think it's I very did different. that with you, did I, Chief? We, we, we did discuss it, and I can okay. tell you this. When that happened, this department was a much, much different department, I, and, and, the, and the, the leadership was had a much different uh, policing idea or idea what police work is. And I will acknowledge that, Chief. I do agree with you in that statement. Um, the, my family joked that we were met with the unwelcome committee <laughs> when we first moved to Chappaqua 10 years ago. And- um, I could have pegged the timing. The, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> you know exactly who I'm I completely, that's, that's why I was, I'm, mean, I'm sitting here and I'm so officers and, and supervisors. It. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so upset listening to it because I'm thinking to myself, if this didn't happen 10 years ago, you know, I, I don't have the insight I think I do. So, and so Chief, I, am, I don't I think they're relieved. still on the force. They are not on the force. They're, right. I tried to track them and I couldn't. So yeah, they haven't been for a while. Uh, great. Great. Thank you. I and, and thank you, Jill. I did share that um good, good. I'm so glad. I'm Chief. I'm so glad because and, he yeah. <laughs> and I, I do want to um, affirm what Chief Carroll has said that my recent experiences um, uh, largely um, has been night and day compared to when I first moved here. So, and I think it's a very, very different police force. Yeah. Having said that, um, I'm always seeing room for improvements. Absolutely, so, absolutely. It's just, it, it, I don't, I don't, I don't know that people appreciate um, the difference. Where we, we, yeah, yeah, it's, where we were and where we are right now. Yeah, and it's yeah. And my, I know that I push hard. Um, I know that I push hard for reform, and it's not mm -hmm. out of a lack of appreciation for the growth. Um, we've had and for the improvements we've had, it's more so for the potential I see. So sometimes when we become very self-congratulatory, um, I think sometimes it's a missed opportunity. And by the way, I have excellent friends and people who I consider friends in the 
Newcastle Police Department, people who we've invited to join us at the farmer's market and, um, you know, officer, the Tolliver officers, Jones and Jones, the, the twins. No, no relation. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. Really? It's so funny. <laughs> Just so many people who I stand with and, and we have great relationships. So my pushing is not for a lack of acknowledgement of the improvements I see. Um, it's just for the, the, the potential I see. I gotcha. And you should gotcha. be pushing. That's what, our, that's what we're doing here. So it, there's nothing wrong. You're in fact doing what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you very much for sharing that. I think it's important sure. for people to be able to get the perspective and understand that there are still issues and that the town has changed a whole lot but yes. there are still issues that need to be addressed. So thank you, yes. Maine, for bringing that up. There, there's something that, uh, that uh, this is on a separate note, and it's not a big thing, but it's a significant thing in that it happens a lot and uh, something that we can easily correct. In the, in the work that I do at Wagon Road, I happen to work with deaf and hard of hearing children and uh, have had a lot of education about that community. And noted, and I see this everywhere, so this is not so unusual, but in, um, in the statement, Chief, that you had there about hearing impaired, it's important to know that that is the greatest insult that deaf and hard of hearing people can be, it can be leveled against them. It's like the N word to deaf and hard of hearing people. And so the appropriate way to speak about that community is deaf and hard of hearing. That is the way they want to be referred to. So I just wanted to point that out. It's easy to correct and it helps everybody just become more inclusive. Well, thank, thank you. you for that. I, I was not aware of that myself. I learned I had to something learn it the hard way. <laughs> thank you. All right, where are you? Toe calls. Does anybody want to discuss this? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to say, Chief, you have eight minutes to discuss and that's it? <laughs> um, what about think... proning? It, this includes proning, right? What's that? The proning, just putting them on the ground, uh, face down. That's, not... uh, that's what this, all part of this uh, prohibition, correct? No, proning would not be um, included in this. Because there have been recent deaths as a result of proning. That's why I was just curious about that. Uh, that's, that's more like exciting delirium when they're actually in cuffs and then taken and put in the vehicle on their stomach. It happened once when it was done. It was happened twice, actually. Um, recently, uh, it was an outside situation. Um, I think one was on the ground and one was on the ground in a garage uh, that was recent, relatively recently. That's why I was just asking. Um, if that's um, something that's employed, that's approved to be used. It's not, it, yeah, it's not excluded from, from uh, handcuffing technique. It's trained, trained in the academy, it's, you know, taught by the FBI. It's, it's, it's currently still an acceptable technique. Okay. Choke holds are not. Yeah. Can you explain, it, oh, sorry, no, go ahead, someone else. No, go ahead, Jeremy. So I, I think what Jeremy's gonna ask is that, um, you know, it, it, do you, does everybody understand the policy? It, it's prohibited unless deadly physical force is authorized. That's the only time it is. So well, if you have seen an employee to chokehold during an arrest, as such we've seen with the NYPD, which has resulted in, in people passing and dying, can you explain how that's different and, and why that's not permissible here and where you're getting these guidelines from? Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know that they actually taught it or it's just their officers used it. You know, we, we were never taught to use it as a technique, you know, not in from the academy training on. So, I, you know, again, it goes to, you know, their policies and procedures or, or their academy or their um, culture. But it's always been, you know, prohibited here unless in this limited circumstance. So, Chief, once again, this goes to the fact that every state, and, and of course, where it's a general observation, we're dealing with New York State and in particular Newcastle, but 
once again, just to mention that every state has a different educational requirement for their for, for policing, right? Oh, uh, yes, in Westchester County, yes, could have a different than another county in, in the state. Would you like to see that unified, like a more unified police, just in on a broader level? You know, I, I, I appreciate what you, you're saying, but I have, you know, I, I think I've said this once before, I have an officer who has um, a GED and I have officers with master's education and I could say that the one with the GED is better than the officer with the master's, right. you know, in certain things. So, you know, I, I think it's all something that should be considered in the personnel selection. Um, and, and I know at this point, you know, it's a civil service decision whether or not it's, um, you know, requirement has changed. Um, so I think you can find a really qualified person with, with limited education. I, and, and I agree. It's just, and I'm not trying to be, uh, the, the argument against my statements is that um, pol uh, areas like um, fire services and police and emergency have traditionally been like a stepping stone for, um, you know, maybe someone who might not have a college degree or maybe a, someone who might not be able to traditionally off, um, afford a college education. And we don't want to be closing the doors from those people. But in terms of their general education, and I do think education is in a different section, isn't it? Um, under this? I, I think it's in section three. Maybe. Maybe. And I do want to clarify something. I, I didn't mean to see the one, say the officer with the master's wasn't a good officer. <laughs> you know, he's a very good officer, but the other one may be a better officer. So. Point taken. Okay. But for example, the same way we fund the police academy, whether it's for 20 weeks or, um, or, or whatever the, the amount of training they go through right now, um, I would, the, the police academy could be funded for a two-year degree. You know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to come out of the pocket of the officers. Um, maybe. I'm just, not opposed to the idea behind it, but I'm just saying what I've seen and, and, you know, my experience, you know, with our personnel. But a, a lot think, of the... Mm -hmm. A lot of the training issues we're addressing right now, that things that might come up on an ongoing basis, those are the things that I think should be taught um, and addressed before someone is turned out on the street with a gun. And that's, that's my reason for bringing up the length and quality of the education of um, our our um police offices because I, I think we had determined in the past based on the limited amount of education in you know the, the, the limited time let's put it that way uh in the police academy before an officer is actually able to go out and and be employed um there are i think three basic areas that they are going to be trained in and the vast and i believe that the area where they where i guess i would call um electives if you will which would be this additional training whether it's how to deal with um, um dispute resolution uh, in various ways or dealing with the mental health issue or what have you that's much more limited because there is not enough time to really address all of this additional area that would be so beneficial to a police officer once he or she's put on, you know, put to work. <laughs> um, and it just seems to me that it, it would benefit everybody, the community and the officers themselves, if they had the opportunity to have a, a longer course of education. I mean, is it something that you would be opposed to or is it something i mean worthy of making a recommendation for i, I wouldn't be opposed to extending the academy no and as a matter of fact the westchester county um department of public safety did put together a, um, a youtube video about all their training and what exactly they do and what the recruits go through i, I can get that and share that with the group 
speaker and maybe help them. That would be you know, the training is 700 hours now. What does it, that come down to? Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm terrible at math. It's 35 weeks, generally 20 hours a week. If 40. Yeah. Does that sound right, Chief? I think it's 40 hours a week, though. Oh, okay, I thought it was 700 hours. But also, just bear in mind, the, um, the police departments are paying the officers when they're in the academy. In other words, taxpayers are funding them going to the academy. But I would imagine taxpayers would like uh, a, a more trained. rounded, yeah. rounded, um, more exceptionally trained officer. I don't uh, disagree I, I with think, you. Yeah. So, so we're, we're at eight o'clock uh, uh, time. Um, I haven't even started as yet. I know, I know. I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I, I live right around the I corner. Have we, notes. Can, we can meet at the corner. I, we only live a few houses away from here. <laughs> well, I, for one, am exhausted. <laughs> um, so, so let's, um, you know, not stop and frisk. Let's just stop and continue. Uh, for, for a future date. Oh, I was oh Jeremy, Jeremy, I tried. Jeremy. I tried. Very that was funny. bad. Very that was funny. Bad. <laughs> so let's let's continue on our on our next date. And Chief, are you going to be sending out stuff again? And 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 even um, if you have slides to send out, maybe we can also share that in advance too. Whatever we need, so that we're all seeing it uh, before I, we. I, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you need to, the the PowerPoint is really just my notes in you know to be put on screen but yes i will prepare section three for our our next meeting if you know if we get to it <laughs> you've Can done I a great a chief carol you've done a great job I, I, and I love all of this you really have great yeah it's it's really helpful. have it is so helpful right chief Thank can we see chief. the department manual uh it's it's an online manual but I, you know if there's certain sections that people want to review, why don't you give me a list of them and I can, you know, make PDFs for it and send it out. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Is it online manual or offline manual? It's online. Everybody, people have access to it in their car, on their phone. Really? Can you just send the yes. link? Yeah, send us the link then. We send only the have a certain amount of um, authorized users oh. that uh, we pay okay. for. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. Okay. Um, Only number Jeremy, of can I just Please. make note for the next meeting that we are, um, we're towards, we, we've ended towards the bottom of page 23 of the manual, of the handbook, um, because I, I do have a couple of notes that begin on 23. So I just want to make sure that we didn't bypass that next week. Okay. Oh, or, no, next week is We're Thanksgiving. Next week. Right. The oh, following week. In two weeks. Well, we don't, you don't want to meet on Thanksgiving? Really? Come on. There's more than 10 we of us. We have turkey Sorry. together. <laughs> and, um, and Jill, I'll reach out with you, uh, reach out to you about the, the survey. Yes, please. That, I would be so we'll, interested to see that. Thank you. Angela is supposed to be on this committee, so we can definitely connect with her and start Perfect. fleshing out the survey. That's that's great. That's great. Thank you, very much. Everyone, and did you? Yeah. And 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 you guys had ideas about um, circulation and how to, um, you know, get a robust response. Um, yes, we we did discuss that. Great. Thank you. Um, so, and I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to all who celebrate. Um, I think we're doing such important work. And um, once again, I know I'm a pain in the ass. Um, but I think we're, I think we're, sh we're, we're, we're doing the hard work. I know we're, we're going to change lives and I really appreciate you all here. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy Thanksgiving. Same here. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Don't eat too much Happy cookies. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Okay. No more than 10 everyone. people. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Be safe. Happy Bye. Thanksgiving.